Welcome to Dangerous Prototypes. I'm Ian. Happy New Year's. It's been a while since we've been in the workshop. I just want to give a huge thanks to everybody who joined us on our geek tours in New York, India, China, and Tokyo this fall. Since we did our last workshop video, we've done some updates. When we moved from the little workshop upstairs to the big one down here, we didn't have as much light. The videos were kind of grainy and shadowy, so we added a bunch of overhead lighting to get clear videos for the workshop. Also, we made these new drawers to hold the free PCB collection. Mailing free PCBs used to be a huge pain. We have to go through the drawers, shelves, and piles of PCBs everywhere to find the ones that were ordered before we could put them in envelopes and get them mailed out. So over the holiday, I made these boxes out of corrugated cardboard. There's a narrow version for smaller PCBs and a wider version for bigger PCBs. Each set of PCBs is separated by a note card with a label saying what it actually is. That should make it quicker to hunt through, spot the ones we want, and pull it out. We're also trying to group revisions together. I use cardboard because it's easy to hack. I wasn't quite sure how tall I wanted the walls and how wide I wanted every box, so the cardboard lets me hack it easy with a pair of scissors or an X-Acto knife to cut the walls down if they're too tall or whatever. The design is pretty straightforward. I just cut a piece of cardboard out sort of like this. The two ends fold up and the sides fold in and secure with tape. For starters, I made the wall of both boxes about six centimeters high. The wider box is 11 centimeters wide, and the shorter one is about eight and a half. These are sizes based both on the size of the PCBs that we're holding in each of them, but also the size of the note cards, so that it's easy to pick a card that fits nicely in the box. The boxes themselves are about half a meter long. Hopefully the new boxes and better organization means faster and easier free PCB shipping, which means you should be getting your free PCBs faster than ever before. And speaking of free PCBs, we got in a new order from Seed Studio just now. We use the QFP proto boards to build and test a complicated circuit before we actually route the PCB for it. There's a footprint for a QFP chip, and that could be an ARM, an AVR, a PIC, MSP430, whatever. We've also got an SOIC footprint, an SSOP chip footprint, and then all sorts of small footprints for USB, Mini-B, uh, service mount components like capacitors, resistors, crystals, buttons, LEDs, and then here there's a large through-hole prototyping area. New in version 2, in addition to the extra QFP footprint on the back, we added a USB micro-B connector, as well as put the whole board in the standard sick of beige format. That way it can be used with one of our cheap acrylic cases once you finish your circuit. You put it between a sandwich case, starting at three bucks. So we'll have those soon up in the seed shop. You can get the version one currently for around $10, I think. These will replace the version one as it runs out and we need to restock. While we've been traveling the world, meeting with readers, checking out electronics wholesale markets, and trying to meet new suppliers and distributors, we picked up a few trinkets. If you've seen our India Geek Tour video, you may recall us buying this fraudulent USB flash drive in managed market in Mumbai, India. We were hoping it was one of those really clever USB drives where it's about a gig of memory, but it says 64 gig. And after you write more than a gig, it just keeps looping around and around and around. So if you write five gig, only the last gig is written to the drive. Even though if you look on the file system, you'll actually see all the correct sizes and files that you copied, but only about one gig will be there of the total capacity. So we were hoping to get one of those and check it out and see how it works. And this is what we bought. So we pop off the cap. If you can see, I'm not sure, the case is pretty mutilated here. It's pretty obvious this drive isn't in very good shape. And if you look at the packaging, it says it's Transcend and, and 64, 32 gig. And it costs us maybe one or two dollars US, I don't recall. But if you look at the back of the card, there's numerous misspellings. So I don't understand why someone would go to the effort of, of making a color printed card for your, your fraudulent flash drive but make so many spelling errors. And it's really obvious stuff too, like Windows and, and Linux are misspelled. We're hoping for this fancy knockoff drive that rewrites the same gig of memory. When you pop it off, you find out we were way overly optimistic. If you wanna make a cheap knockoff drive, all you need to do is put a, a likely a used and salvaged USB connector, no memory, no nothing, right into the little plastic container. and. That's all we got for our dollar. So, slightly disappointing, but also very humorous when we got back to the workshop and finally tore it apart. In China, we picked up this little USB charger. It's got Chinese and European plugs. You plug right into a European outlet and then give you a regulated five volts out for charging an iPod, a phone, or whatever. 
According to the label, it's one amp output. In Huachang Bay Market in Shenzhen, this costs maybe 20 cents or less. And it weighs nothing, USB jack is crooked. Based on the experience with the flash drive in India, we thought for sure there's nothing inside of here or someone speculated maybe it had a large resistor and it was just dropping 220 volts down to 5 volts using resistors. Something horrible that would probably destroy any device connected to it. So in Tokyo, Akiba actually cracked this open for us. And what we were surprised to find is that it actually is a fully working USB power supply. You've got two circuit boards in here, one with a USB connector and a, a capacitor. And over here, I have a little transformer, a couple more capacitors, and uh, some transistors, and one of these, we assume, is a, a regulator chip. This also marks the quasi one-year anniversary of workshop videos. I've been doing them since about October of 2011, but we didn't get into full swing until January of 2012. And since then, we've been counting those as a year. We've done a lot of things. We've been to a lot of maker fairs. We've been to a lot of electronics part markets. We've done a lot of things here in the workshop. So here's a quick retrospective on the evolution of the workshop video. If you'll recall, I started out just a video of hands explaining some electronics things. There's a couple reasons for this. I mean, first, I didn't have enough video cameras to do a multi-shot arrangement like we do now. Second, I was pretty shy and I didn't want my face out there on the internet because the internet's mean. After that, I gained a little confidence and bought a second camera and started filming the workshop videos from up here, sort of an awkward angle high in the sky. The reason for that is I was mounting the cameras on these nasty clamps on a shelf in the bookcase in front of me. I didn't have enough depth to do a straight on video like we do now. So after that, we moved to a whole new building. And we started off with a workshop studio upstairs from where I'm currently sitting in a little tiny attic space that was easy to light and easy to control the light in. And those are probably the best workshop videos we've done so far. But honestly, the space was cramped and it was getting impossible to keep all the gear up there. So we moved the studio downstairs to the main workshop area. This gives us a lot more space, but also has a lot of problems too. It's a much bigger space, so there was a lot of problem with lighting for the first few episodes. But we've only just now solved by installing probably four or five hundred watts of fluorescent light up here above me, along with a couple fluorescent lights in front to make sure we get uh, a nice video without shadow. But also, I'll let you in on a little secret. The floor down here, not at all level. As anyone who's visited the workshop knows, you have to plant your feet and hold yourself at this desk for dear life. If I'm not holding on, the chair immediately runs into the bookshelves. We've also been doing market videos for about a year now. The first was Akihabara in Tokyo. That video premiered, I believe, in February of last year. And then after that, we went to Shenzhen, China, made a video in Hua Chong Bay, which is famous for the karate chopping and the screaming. And after that, we made a, a how-to video on visiting Maker Faire Bay Area. The thing all these videos had in common is we didn't have proper audio. So if you've seen these videos, if you check them out now, you notice most of the time I'm screaming some d dumb line at the camera and also karate chopping to go with it, just trying to project those words out there. Especially in Hua Chong Bay where there was so much, so much construction all the time, it was almost impossible to narrate it. But before we went to Singapore, we wised up and we got the HN1 Zoom microphone. This is the same mic recommended by Dave Jones at EEV Blog, as well as Chris Gamble at the Amp Hour. It's a lot easier to hold interviews this way. You can direct it with the microphone. But also, here in the workshop, I wear a lapel pin and keep one of them in my pocket. That way the audio is a lot clearer, there's less echo, sounds much better. So in a nutshell, that's the evolution of the workshop video. I really appreciate everybody watching. And please, stay tuned. We've got some really interesting stuff coming up in the next couple months. If you want to know even more about Dangerous Prototypes, I suggest you check out the Amp Hour interview I did with Chris Gamble and Dave Jones just a few weeks ago. If you want more workshop videos, or to see all the Global Geek Tour videos, check out the links below. If you want in on the free PCB action, check out our free PCB giveaways three times a week. Once on Twitter, once on Facebook, and once right here on the blog. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you for watching. We'll be back next week with some new PCBs, as well as a Buzzpire educational kit we've been working on. See you then.